pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker. Stephen W. Mosher is president of the Population Research Institute. He was educated at the University of Washington at Stanford University. He enlisted in the U.S. Navy and served with the U.S. 7th Fleet, eventually reaching the rank of lieutenant. In 1979, he became the first American social scientist permitted to do field research in China since the Communist Revolution. He has served as the director of the Asian Studies Center at the Claremont Institute and on the U.S. Commission on Broadcasting to the People's Republic of China. Mr. Mosher has lectured at the U.S. Special Forces Command, the National War College, and the U.S. Navy's Sea Systems Command. He's the author or editor of numerous books on China, including, most recently, Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is a Threat to the New World. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mosher. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here at Hillsdale College again. The crowd seems a little sparser than it was last year, but that's only because we're all socially distanced, right? There are many people watching online or from other locations. And uh, the, uh, I have a special place in my heart for Hillsdale College because it's led by my good friend, uh, Dr. Larry Arn with whom I worked at the Claremont Institute from 1986 to 1995 before going to Washington. Now, I'm here today to talk about China as an election issue. Now, up until a few days ago, of course, I think we all would have agreed that China in one way or another was probably the most important issue in the election. And those who disagreed would have said, no, no, it's the economy, but the economy only takes pride of place because China unleashed some months ago a pandemic on the world and shut down the most vibrant economy that the United States and the world, I think, had ever seen. Without that economic slowdown, I don't think there'd be any, be any doubt about the outcome of the election on November 3rd. And uh, the pandemic, of course, was caused by what President Trump rightly calls the China virus. This is a virus that was created in a Chinese lab, overseen by the People's Liberation Army, and then deliberately released upon the world. That is a topic for another day. But it's all true, uh, and it can be documented. We have more and more studies coming out that show this. There are a lot of people who don't want to talk about it because of the implications of what I just said. But nevertheless, uh, that, is, that is what happened. That's the origin of the virus, and that's the, re the responsibility for the, threat of the spread of the virus rests entirely with Beijing and with senior leader, core leader, the new Red Emperor, uh, Xi Jinping himself. So uh, the U.S. economic setback of late is China's responsibility as well. So again, China is the most important issue in the upcoming election or would have been until last week, Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice, uh, may God rest her soul, was promoted to a higher court and turned the, the political race upside down. But we will get through the nomination and confirmation of the next Supreme Court Justice, I believe, before the new president is, uh, is sworn in next January. And then we will return to the preeminent challenge of our age, and that is uh, the challenge posed by the People's Republic of China, not just to the United States, but to the peaceful, beneficent world order that the United States created after World War II and continues to oversee in important ways. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I happen to be a member of the advisory group for Catholics for Trump 2020. And I uh, actually was a member of the advisory group for Catholics for Trump in 2016 as well. I was an early supporter of Donald Trump for two reasons, both of which have to do with China. Uh, the first reason is life. And uh, 
I was in China in 1979 and 1980 as first American social scientist allowed to do research behind the bamboo, bamboo curtain in 30 years. I found myself in the middle of the most horrific population control program the world has ever seen. Uh, you call it the one-child policy. That's what it was publicly called. Um, for the Chinese people, it was a program of uh, forced abortion, forced sterilization, forced contraception. I was present in the operating room when they were forcibly aborting women at seven, eight, and nine months gestation by cesarean section. I became pro-life uh, when I witnessed those crimes. I think if you uh, witness the killing of a child at, in the third trimester of pregnancy and a forced abortion, if you're not pro-life when you see this, uh, you don't have a human heart beating in your chest. So I was also uh, an early supporter of the president because of the China issue uh, writ large. I have been a critic of the People's Republic of China since 1980. I became aware that, uh, that President Trump was also a critic of the People's Republic of China, at least since the late 1990s, uh, when he criticized their currency manipulation, their cheating on trade, even in those early days. So for those two reasons, uh, I came to support him back in 2016. So I'm going to make three points today. I'm going to talk first about why and how China is a threat to the United States. And then I'm going to talk about the two candidates and where they stand vis-a-vis -vis China. Now, I don't need to tell this audience, I don't think, that the People's Republic of China under the Chinese Communist Party is the greatest threat this country has ever faced. But I will anyway, because the point seems to be in some dispute in some quarters. One presidential candidate fairly recently said uh, that China's not our enemy, it's merely a competitor, quote unquote. China is far more than a competitor. Let's start with the Pentagon's latest uh, China military power report, which came out last week. This latest report notes the regime has, quote, marshaled the resources, the technology, the political will over the last two decades to strengthen and modernize its Army, Navy, and Air Force in every respect. In fact, quote, China is already ahead of the United States in certain areas. That's directly from the Pentagon. It went on to say the Chinese Communist Party now controls the world's largest navy. It is obsessively growing its nuclear and missile arsenal. It warned, the report did, that the goal of this military buildup is nothing less than to, quote, revise aspects of the international order. Revise aspects of the international order is an understatement. The Chinese Communist Party is actually trying to co-opt, undermine, and replace the current world order with a Sinocentric one, a world order in which the decisions about the future of the world will be made uh, not in Brussels or New York or in Washington, D.C., but in Beijing. Now, when this report was released, Beijing was livid. Beijing is now accusing Washington of, quote, hegemony and provocation for telling the truth about its ever more aggressive moves towards what? Towards hegemony and provocation. Now, the regime spokesman went on to say that America is, quote, the real destroyer of world peace and said China's military buildup should not worry any country because it, quote, would not threaten any country. Well, tell that to Taiwan, where you are now seeing constant incursions by the PLA Air Force into Taiwan's airspace. Tell that to uh, India, for example, where Chinese troops continue to encroach on the Indian border, and there has been recent conflict. Tell it to Kyrgyzstan, uh, one of the stands in Central Asia, uh, where China appears to have now voiced a territorial claim to half the country. China is moving in the wrong direction. 
The leader of China, Xi Jinping, has just issued guidelines last week telling nominally private businesses that they must, quote, strengthen the cultivation of, uh, of their loyalty to the party and, uh, and that young entrepreneurs must always listen to and follow the party. Every nominally private company in China is now going to have to have a party cell in its ranks and is going to have to have a chairman of that, or party secretary of that cell, sitting on the board of directors of the company. Now, those of you who run for-profit or non-profit companies know that if you're sitting at one end of the conference table and a member of the Chinese Communist Party is sitting at the other end, who has the ultimate say over the direction of the company? Uh, I think, at the very least, the Communist Party now has veto power over every company uh, in the country. This marks, of course, a radical disappointment for those of us who thought that the private sector of the Chinese economy would continue to grow and blossom over the decades, while the publicly owned sector of the economy, the state-owned sector of the economy, would naturally shrink because of its inherent inefficiencies because of its misallocation of resources. That's not what's happening in China today. That's not what's been happening in China for the last 20 years. The pendulum has swung now decisively in the other direction. Xi Jinping is a communist first and foremost. And like all communists, he wants to seize control in one mean, by one means or another of the means of production. And this new set of guidelines is a step in that direction. So we have to be wary of TikTok, any deal about TikTok that doesn't cut out Chinese owners. The um, Justice Department just last week unsealed indictments charging hackers connected to China's intelligence services with infiltrating 100-plus organizations around the world, including tech companies, government agencies, universities, and manufacturers. And they did this to steal intelligence and steal intellectual property. This, of course, is just the tiniest tip of the iceberg, because there are literally battalions, and I use the word battalion, a military term deliberately, battalions of hackers employed by various intelligence agencies, including military intelligence, to hack into uh, websites and servers around the world to gather intelligence and uh, useful intellectual property. The FBI estimates that China steals $600 billion a year in intellectual property from the United States. Multiply that over 10 years, that's $6 trillion. And that's been going on now uh, for decades. The largest transfer of wealth in human history has been from the United States to China. Of course, while it's stealing intellectual property, stealing intelligence and extorting cash, it is also setting itself up, Beijing is, as the savior of less developed countries. It offers money and goods in exchange for sovereignty. It's even exploiting the pandemic that it caused to this end. Right now, China is offering Latin American and Caribbean countries $1 billion in loans to buy its vaccines when they become available. Now, that's a pretty good business plan, isn't it? You unleash a pandemic on the world. You destroy the early samples of the vaccine um, that are held in private labs in China. Yet, of course, because you know the genome of the vaccine, uh, of the virus that you created, you can quickly develop a vaccine. And then instead of giving it to the world that you've unleashed it on, you actually loan money to countries so they can buy the vaccine to cure the disease that you unleashed on the world. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. So we have, as a result of uh, all of this 
malign activity towards the United States and other countries. We have people like John Ratcliffe, the Director of National Intelligence, warning us, quote, China poses a greater national security threat to the U.S. than any other nation. The threat is economic, it's military, and it's technological. That includes threats of election influence and interference. Of course, it's not just a threat to the United States, it's a threat to Great Britain, Canada, France, all of the countries of the world, especially the democratic countries, even if some of our allies still pretend otherwise. Now we still have, because we're in this curious election year mental state, we still have people like uh, Andrew McCabe, the former deputy director of the FBI, and Adam Schiff, and John Brennan saying that our chief danger in the world is Russia, 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 when in fact it is China, 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 and has been for the past two decades. China is a greater threat than Russia by at least an order of magnitude, and the disparity between Russia and China is growing. And unlike Russia, China is a threat across all domains, not just the military, but economic and technological as well. Now, my friend Peter Navarro, who's been in the White House since the beginning of the Trump administration, likes to list what he calls China's seven deadly sins. Peter says that uh, China needs to stop stealing our intellectual property. Stop forcing technology transfers. You want to do business in China, you have to transfer your technology into the hands of the Chinese government, which oftentimes promptly sets up a competing factory using the same technology that you've just transferred. Peter also says we need, we need to stop China from hacking our computers. China needs to stop dumping goods at below market prices into our markets. And China needs to stop putting our companies out of business. China needs to stop state-owned enterprises from receiving heavy subsidies. And China needs to stop exporting fentanyl uh, to the United States, which kills tens of, million, uh, tens of thousands of uh, Americans each year. China also needs, he says, to stop currency manipulation. Of course, Peter Navarro's seven deadly sins mostly address China's economic sins against the United States, except for the fentanyl issue. But there are many other sins that China is committing against the U.S.-led international order as well, against the U.S. political system, and against Americans themselves. China has made, as most of you know, uh, enormous and destabilizing claims in the South China Sea. Uh, their claims in the South China Sea are roughly equivalent to the U.S. claiming the entire, entire Caribbean as sovereign U.S. territory. China also is encroaching along the Indian border. It is making a claim against the country of Kyrgyzstan that it owns the Pamir mountain range, which is basically the, the, uh, the eastern half of the country. It also claims that it owns not just the Senkaku Islands, which are Japanese territory, but it also owns Okinawa and the entire Ryukyu chain as well. That's the chain of islands stretching from the southern Japanese home island of Kyushu down to Taiwan. Why does it claim Okinawa? Because in, in 1778, the daimyo, the shogun in charge of Okinawa, sent tribute to the Qing imperial court which were evermore locked in Okinawa as a tributary state of, uh, of China. Um, it is also a senior Chinese official, astonishing the world, recently pointed out that up until the unequal treaty with Russia between China and Russia of 1860, China had owned Vladivostok and the Russian Far East as well. I'm sure Vladimir Putin wasn't happy to hear that. Maybe that's one reason why Russia is currently moving additional troops uh, to the area as we meet today. Obviously, any territorial claims, unresolved territorial issues are destabilizing. But for China, it seems to be all in a, in a day's work. It has made territorial claims against most of its uh, immediate neighbors. Specifically on the election, of course, Bill Barr was here last week.
Both the Attorney General William Barr and National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien have recently remarked that it is not Russia, but China, that has taken, quote, the most active role in interfering in uh, the U.S. elections. And I just want to go over a couple things that China is actually doing in this regard, because most people don't know the extent of China's election interference. Most of it occurs uh, on, um, on, on the Internet. Uh, but some things are, are quite open. The Global Times, which is the English language newspaper uh, run by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, recently published an article saying that uh, that most leaders in the world prefer, prefer Joe, that Joe Biden be elected as president of the United States because Joe Biden is smoother than Donald Trump. Well, uh, then China has what it calls uh, the Wu Mao army. Uh, Wu Mao is 50 cents in, in Chinese, and the Chinese Communist Party hires uh, hundreds of thousands of people to propagate the party line, both inside of China and outside of China, it pays them 50 cents, Wu Mao, a posting. Now, you can't become wealthy <laughs> making 50 cents a posting, but I guess you can make a good living. And so the Wu Mao army is waging information warfare against us, trying to manipulate their election. I have a, a Twitter account, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> but I had to open it uh, a couple of years ago because of... Uh, because of the, uh, the rising threat from China. And I get postings from the Wu Mao army on my Twitter account. It's the most ridiculous thing uh, that you can imagine. Uh, the Wu Mao army is not particularly fluent in English, and so it's pretty obvious when, uh, when it comes from China. It's crude, uh, but I think with some people it can be, it can be effective. And they're posting, you know, they're, they're getting paid to troll our internet with anti-Trump, pro-Biden messages. Social media is a tool that the Communist Party is using to influence what's going on here. So, the, uh, we also had the director of the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, William Evanina, saying that we assess that China prefers that President Trump does not win re-election. We also know that there are, social, there are spam dissemination networks that are paid for, set up by the Chinese Communist government, that set up a large number of fake accounts uh, that have launched violent attacks on President Trump on social media. Um, we also know, and, and I was involved in, um, in setting up Radio Free Asia many years ago, Radio Free Asia recently published an article asserting that the reason that we closed down the Houston Consulate of the People's Republic of China was because Chinese military intelligence was using it as a base to recruit militants for Antifa and BLM activities, contributing, of course, to the unrest that, uh, that apparently China hoped would lead to Trump's defeat in November. And then there was the video of Chinese-speaking rioters outside the White House a few weeks ago who, when people began to notice them, were ordered by their leader to withdraw, uh, speaking perfect um, Mandarin Chinese. So um, all of this election interference, I think, makes anything that Russia is doing look childish. It's much more sophisticated and much more pervasive. So now that we've established that China is the principal threat to the US-led world order and to democracy in the United States, interfering with our election in a way that uh, Vladimir Putin could only dream of, of having done, we need to look at the two candidates. Now, last week, the New York Times released a 3,100-word story entitled, Joe Biden's China Journey. The three authors of the piece engaged in an effort to explain the former vice president's long relationship with the People's Republic of China. And at the end of the article, they suggested that uh, the current uh, 
Democratic nominee is ready to get really, really tough on China, tougher even than Donald Trump. Now, I've known uh, Joe Biden for a long time, and in my view, Biden has appeased China and advanced its interests for as long as I've been paying attention to him. Um, and indeed, as long as I've been interested in China policy, which is to say shortly after he arrived in Washington in 1973 and I arrived in Hong Kong with the U.S. 7th Fleet. I think American workers and the American economy have paid a heavy price for the combination of naivete and greed that has driven his views of China over the decades. The naivete came first, of course. The greed came later. In the 90s, uh, Biden pushed for and re repeatedly voted to protect China's most favored nation trading status. And that ensured that Chinese made goods would flood America's big box stores. We most favored nation status was up for review every year in the 80s and 90s. And it was used as leverage by the United States to try and get political prisoners in China released, for example, to try to get China to move in the direction of respecting human rights and, and, a, and a more open society. We gave all that up uh, in the late 1990s. Uh, Senator Biden was also a champion of China's entry into the World Trade Organization under terms that heavily favored the communist giant. China was allowed into the World Trade Organization under terms that treated it as a less developed country, which meant that while it had free access to American markets, it could restrict access to its own. This blunder has cost the U.S. 60,000 factories and three and a half million jobs. Now, Senator Biden did all this despite admitting that the PRC had a, quote, reprehensible record on human rights and unfair trade practices. But with um, people in Washington, of course, you have to look beyond the rhetoric and see what they actually do. And Senator Biden's actions with regard to Beijing have obviously benefited China, and in more recent years, his family. Now, one of the points made by the New York Times authors was that he was a strong advocate in the early 1990s of setting up Radio Free Asia. Radio Free Asia is a radio free broadcast service that broadcasts news and information into China about events in China itself, bypassing, bypassing state censorship and control. So that when labor unrest occurs, when villagers are upset because their land has been confiscated by the local Communist Party secretary, when uh, people demonstrated against the one-child policy and forced abortions. When episodes like this occurred in China, Radio Free Asia would report on it, broadcast it into China so the Chinese people would know what was happening in their own country. Now, Senator Biden's defenders claim that he was instrumental in establishing this federally funded news network to promote democratic values within China. One of his Senate Foreign Relations Committee aides at the time, James Rubin, told the New York Times that Senator Biden worked hard to set up Radio Free Asia because he realized that China was a brutal system after the 1989 crackdown against protesters around Tiananmen Square. The 1989 crackdown against protesters around Tiananmen Square was brutal. It resulted in the deaths of at least 10,000 people in Beijing, we estimate. And to make matters worse, uh, the day after the protest was put down, army columns of army trucks pulled up in front of the hospitals and cl medical clinics in Beijing, and all of the wounded were taken away, um, most never to be heard from again. So when you ex want to expunge the memory of a debacle like the Tiananmen Square massacre, um, you, you have to destroy the evidence. Uh, the evidence that these wounded were carrying on their very bodies. Not all of those who worked with Biden at the time, however, were that impressed with his efforts on Radio Free Asia. I served as commissioner 
of the Presidential Executive Commission on Broadcasting to the PRC in the early 90s. I served alongside of two commissioners handpicked by Senator Biden. Uh, both of Senator Biden's commissioners fought against the establishment of Radio Free Asia every step of the way. And in the end, both of them voted against it. The vote at the end uh, of the day to establish Radio Free Asia was very, very, a very close run thing. It was six to five. Biden's commissioners were on the wrong side. We met with Senator Biden later uh, to try and shore up his support for Radio Free Asia. Uh, he sort of laughed off the defection of his two commissioners. He talked about his personal support for the project, and he said, it just shows how open-minded and objective I am that my, both of my commissioners voted the wrong way. That's not the way I read it. Uh, it, it showed, to my way of thinking, it showed that he was asleep at the switch. So what you get with many politicians is rhetoric and no action. So uh, Radio Free Asia was established uh, in 1994, and the senators who um, godfathered it were Senator Jesse Helms and John McCain, not, uh, not Senator Joe Biden. So... Then we have the September 2000 debate over whether or not to grant most permanent, most favored nation status to China. Uh, we also had China's accession to the World Trade Organization. We also have, you know, the, the, the myth that has been believed by many in the foreign policy establishment until recent years. And the myth was that China's rise was not only inevitable, that, that the United States should welcome it. Uh, Biden said, along with many people in the 90s and in the early years of this century, that, quote, a rising China is an incredibly positive development for not only China, but for the United States and the rest of the world. What a difference a pandemic makes. As vice president, Biden's efforts to enable China's rise accelerated. In May 2013, he helped to engineer a memorandum of understanding that exempted the People's Republic of China's corporations from U.S. security statutes and regulations. This means that over the last seven years, the Chinese Communist Party has raised trillions of dollars from our debt and equity markets on preferential terms, giving them an advantage over American firms. How so? Because the memorandum of understanding that he negotiated as vice president exempted Chinese companies listed in U.S. stock exchanges from independent audits, allowing them to continue to cook their books while raising billions from unsuspecting U.S. investors. It is um, commonly known in China that companies keep two or three sets of books. They keep one set of books uh, for the public, and for naive foreigners, they keep a second set of books uh, for their Chinese partners, and then the pr principal owner will keep a set of books so he knows exactly how much money he's making. So this memorandum of understanding, which we're now trying to get uh, rid of, uh, gave Chinese companies uh, exemptions from the kind of oversight uh, that allowed them to hide the risk that uh, investing in them posed to U.S. investors. On the human rights front, uh, Vice President Biden was largely missing in action. When he did speak out in public, it was to soft pedal Chinese Communist Party abuses. He said on one visit to China that he understood, quote unquote, the need for the brutal one-child policy. Uh, as an eyewitness to that brutal one-child policy, I, um, I found that comment unfathomable. He was also nominally in charge of what we call the Pivot to Asia, which was announced in 2011 and was our effort to reorient our forces to face the challenge of the 21st century, which is the challenge of China. To counter China's continuing military buildup. Yet as China militarized the South China Sea and bullied smaller neighbors such as the Philippines and Vietnam into accepting its claims, 
Uh, by the time that uh, the Obama-Biden administration had left office, we had added exactly one warship to the Seventh Fleet, which is hardly an impressive pivot in my view. Now, I'm not even going to talk about why he took his son Hunter to Beijing in December 2013. Everyone, I think, knows that story. Um, what I would like to, to, to conclude with uh, in talking about the former vice president is his comments since leaving office. Even as the danger from a rising China pose, that a rising China poses to the U.S. has become more and more apparent, uh, the former vice president has continued to apologize for the PRC. He has repeatedly in speeches over the last few years dismissed or downplayed China's threat to American national security and to American jobs. He claimed as recently as last year that China, the Chinese Communist Party said they're not bad folks and they're not competition. He did recently say that they are our competitor which is a step in the right direction, but they are much, much more than a competitor. They are a threat to the United States and to the world. So given the many, many ways that China has harmed American businesses and workers by intellectual property theft, by forced technology transfer, currency manipulation, dumping below cost, predatory pricing by state-owned enterprises, widespread use of slave labor, Slave labor, slave labor. We have in the western part of China, we have a minority, about 12 million strong, of Turkish-speaking Uyghurs. And China, under Xi Jinping, has decided that the minorities in China must be eliminated. Not physically eliminated, we're not hurting, they're not hurting the minorities into the gas chambers, but eliminated uh, eliminated culturally. And so what's being done in what's called Eastern Turkestan by the people who live there is this. Between one and three million uh, Uyghur men are now in concentration camps. The Chinese Communist Party, which has a way with words, calls them vocational training camps. Uh, they're forced to work uh, for free. And in the evenings, after a long uh, day of working in textile mills or other factories, producing goods for export to the United States and other countries, they then are forced to endure mandatory study sessions where they are taught Chinese and taught, of course, the, the, uh, the sayings of uh, Supreme Leader Xi Jinping. They are allowed, the men are allowed one hour a week to cry. That's That's, Sounds like a joke, doesn't it? But it's not. One hour a week, they're allowed to cry for their, for their wife, for the children that they're missing. To cry any other time is a sign of insubordination and will be punished. As for the children, uh, the younger children are often sent to boarding schools uh, where they're allowed to call home once a month. In the boarding school, of course, the language of instruction is Chinese, not Turkish. And uh, there's no mention of... Uh, the Islamic faith or the heritage of the, uh, the cultural heritage of the, of the Uyghur people. Uh, as far as the, the older uh, adolescents and young people are concerned, the unmarried ones uh, are being sold to factories on the east coast of China in lots of a hundred. Uh, you can order them in lots of a hundred. You needn't worry about their strange dietary habits. After all, they're Turkish and not Chinese, so they they, have, they like to eat different things because they come with their own cooks. And you needn't worry about security because they come with their own police detachment. All you have to provide is a factory dormitory inside the factory compound uh, that has to be surrounded by a high fence. The Uyghur workers are allowed out on Sunday afternoon for a few hours, but only under escort. I think that qualifies as slave labor. And then, of course, you have the women and a few small children left at home. They're not left alone, however. About a million Chinese police uh, and officials have been billeted with the women and small children uh, at home. There was a recent uh, story that came out by one woman who escaped from eastern Turkestan about the, the, the sexual violence being visited on the women. So you have the men in prison, the women being compromised, the, 
the young adults being sold as slave labor and the small children being uh, successfully, I think, probably cynicized, uh, the goal of clearly is to eliminate the Uyghurs as, as a people. Uyghurs have been around for a long time, several thousand years, but they may not be around for much longer because of this deliberate forced effort at, uh, at cynicization. Same thing is being done uh, to some degree in the Mongol-speaking regions of China in the north and in Tibet in the south where the teaching of the Tibetan language even in the elementary school, the teaching of the Mongolian language even in the elementary school is now forbidden. Uh, the children are to learn Chinese. So, um, you know, we, we could talk for a long time about the human rights abuses in China, but that's not the point of the talk today. Uh, fewer and fewer people outside of China regard China's rise as anything but a disaster for America and for the world. More and more people understand that China is carrying out what it calls unrestricted warfare against the United States across all domains except the kinetic. Okay. There was a book called Unrestricted Warfare published in 1999 by two senior PLA colonel strategists called Unrestricted Warfare. And it argued that the uh, People's Republic of China should be constantly warring against the United States. It should be using all the means at its disposal. It should be sending uh, deadly drugs to the United States to weaken the US. Uh, uh, we see that in the shipments of fentanyl. It should be constantly stealing, uh, launching cyber attacks, stealing personal data and intellectual property from the United States. Um, again, China has been at war with the United States across all domains for decades, except the kinetic. We're not firing bullets at each other. But in every other way that the Chinese Communist Party can, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to weaken the United States with the goal of ultimately destroying it. Now, Unfortunately, um, we have, uh, fortunately, we have one candidate for president who understands the threat from China. And I think initially uh, Donald Trump saw the threat as principally economic, right? Uh, the dumping of Chinese made goods, the currency manipulation, the cheating on trade. Uh, since the pandemic, of course, he sees it as a threat, uh, uh, which it properly is across all domains. We have another candidate who says, however, that he's going to end the tariffs on Chinese-made goods. He's going to not hold Ch Communist China accountable for unleashing the China virus on the world, but is attempting to blame Trump for the outbreak. He is um, going to cooperate, according to his plan, with China in three areas, in climate change, non-proliferation, and health security are three areas that uh, presidential candidate Joe Biden says that we can cooperate with China. Now, all three of these areas are well by their sell-by date, okay? Uh, Joe Biden may be committed to shut down every last coal-fired plant in the United States in the name of curbing climate change. But China is just as determined to continue building them. China is opening a new coal-fired power plant every two weeks or so. So what's there to discuss? China will continue doing that. China was exempted from the Chinese, from the Paris Climate Accords, by the way. So uh, the rules that would apply to us, the rules that would hamstring our economy, did not apply to China. Working with China on nuclear and missile non-proliferation agreements almost sounds like a serious policy proposal until you realize that Beijing is probably the worst proliferator of both in the world today. Pakistan, North Korea, and Iran are among the known beneficiaries of China's assistance in these areas. And finally, working with China on health security sounds like a parody given that China deliberately unleashed a deadly virus on the world and continues to lie about it to the present day. So um, we now approach the November election. Um, Joe Biden has finally begun cautiously denouncing China as a dictatorship, a dictatorship, which is kind of like calling a Category 5 hurricane a summer breeze. Um, 
the high-tech tyranny that dominates the Chinese people and even dreams of extending its writ to the entire world is like no other adversary the United States has ever encountered. The Chinese Communist Party is, like all Communist parties, a war party. That is to say, the party itself is organized along military lines and is inherently expansionist. Its leaders have long understood that there are irreconcilable differences between China and the United States, between what it calls socialism with Chinese characteristics and free market democracy. There are irreconcilable differences between the current US-dominated international order and the Sinocentric one that Beijing hopes will replace it. That means that there is no win-win scenario involving democratic China uh, democratic America and communist China. They're only temporary truces. The new Cold War between China and the United States is a zero-sum game, which will only be resolved when one system decisively triumphs over the other. China has been in a Cold War with us at least since 1991, when then senior leader Deng Xiaoping said to his fellows. The old Cold War is over. The Soviet Union has been defeated. The new Cold War has begun, and China will defeat the United States. But I would say that the Cold War basically goes back to the founding of the People's Republic of China. Because even as early as 1958, then Chairman Mao Zedong set up an Earth Control Committee in the senior ranks of the Chinese Communist Party. He was convinced that his great leap forward would lead to rapid modernization in China and that he was already uh, looking beyond China's borders to the day when it would hold sway over Asia and much of the rest of the world. So this has been in the minds of, of uh, leaders in China for a long, long time. I think that um, President Trump, post-pandemic, now understands this. I think that um, Vice President Biden, although he's moving in the right direction, does not. I'm afraid that, that one candidate, if elected, would try to restore the status quo ante, the one that heavily favored China for the last 25 years. The other, of course, will continue uh, the current policy of isolating China. There are alliances being formed against China right now. China, by releasing a pandemic on the world, has done more in the last six months to unite the world against it than any American president could have done over the course of a decade. India, Japan, Australia, even New Zealand, the Philippines, Taiwan, are all coming together in various ways to defend themselves against this new menace. I think that an Asian NATO is now, for the first time, a realistic possibility, building on the quadrilateral discussions that we're currently having between Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. We need such an alliance. We need such an alliance to counter the greatest threat facing the world today, the People's Republic of China. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melcher. We now have time for some Q&A. If you have a question, please make your way to a microphone. Oh. Hello. Um, as we reevaluate our relationship with China, what, if any, are some positive aspects to our relationship that we should maintain? As we reevaluate, I'm I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be looking uh, over here. Yes, and and the question was, as we reevaluate our relationship with China, what are some positive aspects that we ought to keep in mind? Uh, we ought to keep in mind that the Chinese people are the first and foremost victims of the Chinese Communist Party. The 92 million members of the Chinese Communist Party 
eat, uh, drink, and, and feast on the hard work and entrepreneurial spirit of the Chinese people. The Chinese Communist Party produces nothing in terms of wealth. It's estimated by Chinese economists inside of China, who got in trouble for saying this, by the way, that the Chinese Communist Party consumes about one and a half trillion dollars in wealth about 10% of the country's GDP every year in its salaries, in its offices, in its homes, in its villas, resorts, foreign trips, chauffeured limousines, and so forth. All of the perks that go along with holding power over the Chinese people. So we must never forget that the Chinese Communist Party has victimized its own people first and foremost. I mentioned the one-child policy, but if we go back and we total up the number of people killed in the land reform, in the various anti-rightist campaigns of the 1950s, in the Great Leap Forward, in the Cultural Revolution, in the famine that followed the Great Leap Forward, where 42 and a half million people died. That's 42 and a half million people died of starvation. If we go total up the total number of victims in China, the Chinese Communist Party, the number excluding uh, the number of babies aborted is probably around 100 million. So. That's what we need to keep in mind. We also need to keep in mind that the Chinese people on Taiwan have succeeded where the Chinese people on the mainland have not in setting up a full-fledged democracy. And uh, so we know the Chinese people are capable of democracy if we could simply help end the misrule of the Chinese Communist Party on the mainland. Uh, that, of course, uh, Taiwan is a beacon of freedom for the Chinese people, which is precisely why the Chinese Communist Party is so determined to crush it. Uh, Hong Kong was also such a beacon of freedom for the Chinese people, which is why this year we have seen uh, day after day the crushing of freedoms in Hong Kong. Uh, the tearing up of the agreement between China and Great Britain that was supposed to preserve the freedom and, and uh, social and economic system in Hong Kong uh, for the next 30 years is now gone by the wayside. So we must be very careful to distinguish between the party and, uh, and the people. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm aware, or I should say, I know that you are aware of uh, the fact that uh, we have unwittingly invested a tremendous amount of money in China. I, you mentioned the SEC uh, issue, but one of the things that concerns me is we have so many uh, investment organizations, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, retirement programs. I'm from Wisconsin. Wisconsin has a tremendous amount of money invested in China. CalPERS is uh, at one time was actually being managed by a Chinese, mm -hmm. and, and uh, they only realized what was going on because they too have a tremendous amount of uh, money. We're talking about trillions, not millions or billions, trillions of dollars that are financing things in China, including right. uh, companies that are owned by the Chinese military. Right. How can we do something to get them delisted as a first step, uh, and how can we get these managers of all these retirement programs to get rid of these things? Well, we should. Uh, your, your point is very well taken. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party has profited enormously by the investments uh, from various retirement funds in the United States, and we're working hard to try to end that, that uh, that flow of money to China. China has a controlled currency. China needs hard dollars in order to carry out its military modernization program, in order to loan money to Caribbean and Latin American countries so it can buy the Chinese-made vaccine to cure the Chinese-made virus, for example. It needs access to hard currency. And we, by giving it access to our capital markets, have, have literally enabled it to have access to trillions of dollars. Uh, a number of us have been working to stop this. Uh, we did get the, the um, uh, Stephen Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, and, uh, and, and others involved in an effort to stop the Federal Retirement Thrift Corporation from investing federal retirement funds in, in Chinese corporations. 
for reasons that I've already outlined, because those, those, uh, those corporations are not subject to the same rules uh, governing American corporations when it comes to having regular audits, when it comes to revealing the, the risk to, to, to shareholders of investing in those, uh, those, those uh, particular stocks and bonds. So we have to do more. We have to, to solve this problem at the state level as well, because it's literally as if the United States uh, is, is, uh, is donating blood to China um, unit after unit, keeping the Chinese Communist Party's enterprise uh, flush with funds. And if we were to cut off that, that uh, capital transfusion, I think the Chinese Communist Party would shortly find itself uh, in, in uh, even worse straits than it is. The um, debt levels in China are enormous. We don't know exactly how high they are. Uh, the debt that's on the books is, is uh, almost 300% of GDP, but we know there's a lot of debt off the books. Uh, off the books debt is, is incurred by local governments, by, by township, by county officials who uh, engage in secret deals. Uh, that benefit themselves and their cronies. So there's a tremendous amount of debt in China. Eventually that, uh, that debt will prove unsustainable, especially if we cut off access to, uh, to U.S. financial markets. The other thing that you can say in this regard is that now that China is no longer a separate uh, entity in, in, uh, in economic terms, uh, there's no reason why the Hong Kong dollar uh, should be allowed to be uh, traded uh, no country is allowed to have two currencies, right? The United States only has one currency, the U.S. dollar. China now effectively has two. It has the renminbi, which is not uh, freely convertible, and it has the Hong Kong dollar, which is. Uh, the Hong Kong dollar should be, should be ended. Uh, they're, they're using, they're going to be using, uh, let's see, with the, the uh, Alibaba is announcing uh, a um, $30 billion stock offering for its investment group, ANT, A-N-T, uh, which will be offered on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And there are lots of American financial firms that are eager to get their hands on the $300 million in commissions uh, that will result from, from selling that offering. But again, um, Hong Kong is no longer a separate entity. Hong Kong should not be allowed to be used in this way by China, by the Chinese Communist Party. On the one hand, as it crushes the freedom of the people of Hong Kong, on the other, it continues to use Hong Kong to drain resources from the United States and, and the West to support its, uh, its project of domination. Go to, back to something you said right there at the beginning of your talk regarding the effect that the pandemic had on the world economy. The, I want to make a distinction here and see if um, you can clarify on this point. But the reality is these lockdowns and the, the economic damage was caused by the American government and state officials who restricted businesses, who locked people in their homes, who restricted travel. That wasn't something that Xi Jinping or the communist Chinese regime did. That was something our regime did. And so in light of that, can we really say that the Chinese regime is the greatest threat facing America when you have politicians in this country who are the ones who are actually implementing the policies that are constraining the freedom of everyday Americans? Well, I think that's a very interesting point and very well put. Um, but I, I, would, I would answer by saying that, that uh, there's probably enough blame to go around here, given, given the d dramatic health and economic consequences of what we've seen since the beginning of the year. But the majority of the blame, the lion's share of the blame, obviously belongs uh, with China. Um, I think it's very clear I was, uh, uh, I've been investigating this since it began uh, in, um, in China uh, late last year. And um, I've also, some of you may have seen Dr. Uh, Yen Li Meng, who is a whistleblower from China, a leading virologist who's come out with information about the, how the virus was designed in the lab in Wuhan, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and then spread throughout the world. Planes from Wuhan were not allowed to fly to other Chinese cities, but planes from Wuhan filled with passengers, some of whom were unknowingly infected with the Wuhan virus, were allowed to fly to New York and San Francisco and Milan and, and so forth. So China deliberately spread the pandemic. China also kind of set the tone in this way. Remember, um, 
it locked down the city of Wuhan and, and the surround, most of the surrounding province. The, the largest quarantine in human history. About 50 million people right in that immediate area were placed under quarantine. And we saw pictures of people dropping dead in the streets of Wuhan, right? Uh, those, those, uh, that footage was allowed out of China. We saw the crematoria running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to dispose of the bodies of those who died. So everything that we were told by, the, by Beijing and by the World Health Organization, which was a co-conspirator in, in, uh, in, uh, in this matter, was that this was not only a very infectious disease, but an extraordinarily deadly disease. And that we had no choice but to follow China's example in, 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 in engaging in complete lockdowns. So China set the tone in this. And, and of course, some, some, some of our uh, state governors have followed. But there's enough blame to go around. I mean, look at the 10,000 deaths in nursing homes in New York, entirely unnecessary. The deaths of thousands in nursing homes in, um, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. So um, I'm not going to let American politicians off the hook on that. I, I think that uh, they did overreact on the basis of information, on the basis of inflated projections. My goodness, Niall Ferguson, the University College of London, had a garbage algorithm that predicted two million deaths. And being a widely respected epidemiologist, uh, when Dr. Burks and uh, Deborah Burks and uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci heard that, that there, the, the UK might suffer 500,000 deaths and the algorithm showed that the US might suffer two million deaths from this, uh, this China virus, they went to see President Trump and they said, you know, we must do everything we can to stop the spread of this disease because millions of American lives are at risk. That was the information we were given. So, you know, you can only operate on the best, best science, the best information you have, and there's been an awful lot of misinformation about this, uh, this China virus from the beginning.